Welcome to Micro Lectures by Living on the Red Planet. This lecture, we're continuing the Crater series. Now, the seed question for last lecture was, why does Mars have so many more craters than Earth? And we talked about how Earth has much more weather, it has active plate tectonics, and that it actually would erase and does erase the craters which form from impacts, but that the planet doesn't necessarily get fewer impacts than Mars or any of the other inner planets. So this week, we're going to focus more specifically on these impacts that we were talking about, on these objects and the craters themselves. And our seed question is, where are these objects coming from? And when they hit, what happens? What do they do? So to talk about where they're from, what the impacts are, let's step back to what will soon become the very familiar topic of the formation of the solar system. And stellar evolution is a huge, huge topic. So that deserves its own series of lectures, which we may or may not do. But for our purposes, what we need to know is that at a certain point in our sun's formation, it stopped, basically it stopped pushing out as much. The solar winds died down enough that objects could start to form. And depending on how close you were to the star, or how close the objects were, that would determine what the temperature was. So the closer to the sun, the closer to the star, the hotter. And the further out, the colder. So that determined what elements, because each element has a different freezing point. It has different temperatures and pressures at which it changes phases. So we have a gradation of what objects are made from. And we've talked before about we've got these rocky inner planets and we start to move out and we go through the asteroid belt and then we get to the giants and past them. Okay, so we've passed our Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We get the Kuiper belt and then we get something called the Oort cloud. Now these are really broad categories and really broad regions of space and there's actually lots of other little stuff happening in between and lots of other objects, but these are the general neighborhoods. So our impacts are going to be coming in general from the comets, which are out in the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, and from asteroids. Now our asteroids tend to be made of heavy, rocky, you know, metals, things like that. Whereas the comets are icy and you know, we call them dusty ice balls. Uh, interestingly, a, a sort of side comet, um, there is an idea that much of the water on Earth, and presumably Mars, actually came from impacts from comets. And think about how many comets that would have had to have been to fill up oceans. So we've got these different bodies, and the thing is, how did they get to the inner solar system? Now, anything that's in the solar system is, by definition, orbiting the sun or orbiting something which is orbiting the sun. So a moon, you know, for instance, our moon is orbiting us and then we are orbiting the sun. Now, when we have very circular orbits, so we talk about eccentricity um, and we typically measure that between a zero and a one. And if you're looking at an orbital equation, this will be the lowercase e. So something which is a perfect circle is going to be a zero. And anything above one stops being closed. So the orbit doesn't come back around. It just shoots out, you know, goes out forever. So the very circular orbits, the objects are going to stay pretty far away from the sun. But the more elliptical your orbit becomes, it has to come closer to the sun. So let's imagine, imagine a, an analog clock, right? So we've got our, our circle and in the center you have the sun. Now, if you took a hold of three and nine o'clock and started to stretch it, pull them apart, you start to get the, you know, an oval instead of a circle. And now what's going to happen to 12 o'clock and six o'clock? Those are going to get closer and closer to the center. So when we have an object like a comet that has a highly elliptical orbit, it goes very far out, but then it has to come in close to the sun. During that approach and uh, when it's leaving 
So when it comes close to the sun and then is going out, it has to pass through the inner solar system. Now, the inner solar system is a huge place, but there's a lot of comets, there's a lot of asteroids, and again, not all of them are coming, but those with the highly elliptical orbits, yes. Every now and, th now and then, there's something in the way, and then they end up hitting it, and that's where we're getting most of our impacts. Now, there's another type of a source for impacts, which is fascinating, and that is, say an object hits the planet. Let's say we have a comet, and it hits, or an asteroid, and it hits Mars, and it hits it so hard that it actually throws material into space. Then we have these rocks that are just hanging out in space, and they'll be there until something gets in the way. And in the past, this happens every day, it's happened for billions of years, there's Earth, there's Venus, there's Mercury. And we actually have rocks that we believe come from Mars from that process. Now, it can happen the other way around. It's far easier for something to go from further out in the solar system and come in, because it's not having to fight against gravity. But it is possible that rocks from Earth have actually gone to Mars, and we know that rocks from Mars have come to Earth. So those are our things which can cause these impacts. And in today's world, also, we have artificial satellites which could come down, theoretically. Something important to note here, which we didn't really talk about last time, is atmospheres. Now, when uh, the object is traveling through an atmosphere, to us it doesn't seem very thick, but there's actually enough there that you can get friction, and so the thicker your atmosphere is, the more likely your object is to burn up. And of course this depends highly dependent on what speed and angle you're going in at, and so when we send uh, our spacecraft through, we have to do very cal careful calculations to make sure that we don't completely burn it up. So, we've mentioned before, Mars does in fact have an atmosphere, and in the past we believe that it had a much thicker atmosphere. So very small objects probably burned up in the process of reaching the surface. So on the Moon, which does have an atmosphere, but really for most purposes it's so tiny that we don't even consider it, it can be hit by dust, and that dust is going to make an impact. But you have to get slightly larger objects to get to the surface of Mars or the surface of Earth. So we started to talk a little bit about speed and angle, and those are some of the factors which are really important in determining what the shape and how that impact is going to affect the surface that it hits. So we know that the size is going to make a really big difference, what speed it's traveling at, the angle, and also what its composition is. What is doing the hitting, and what is it hitting? So imagine a very large impact coming and hitting a body of water. That's going to have a different result than if it hits a hard, dry lava plain, for instance. So a little bit of terminology here. Typically I've been saying impact, formation, impact, um, crater, basin, those things. Now a basin, typically, and there's a lot of exceptions here, but we usually say a basin is anything that's larger than 300 kilometers in diameter. So they are just massive formations, and the older it is, the more likely it'll be that there'll be new impacts that happened inside of that crater. And we mentioned that a little bit last time, what we call the law of super superposition, excuse me, so super on top of position, and we can figure out, we can piece together the puzzle of how old the surface is and how recent certain impacts are based on the order of their layering on top of each other. Now, we have two big categories, so going to the actual impact, moving out of what's doing the impact and saying, let's look at the crater, let's look at the result, and we have two different big categories very simple categories. We have simple craters, and we have complex craters. And we're going. there's several different types of features that we see in these craters. Now our simple ones typically are our smaller ones. They usually are much more uniform. And what we'll see is 
we'll see some sort of depression where it hit. And that's something that's fairly, you know, that's universal with all of the craters, of course. So we get this kind of bowl shape. Whether it's more circular or more of an elongated has to do with what angle it was hit at. Now, typically, we'll also see a rim. So that little area around it, which is like a little wall, it's raised up from the ground. A complex crater, and these are more typical with larger impacts, have some extra features that we don't see in our simple craters. And that will be things like a central peak. So we'll get this uplifting in the very middle of the crater, which can happen when the impact's large enough, and it has to do with the way that the force that's been basically sent through the surrounding material when this impact has occurred. We'll have ejecta, which is things which are ejected from the, the bowl, from the impact site. And sometimes we get these very interesting ray patterns. Um, think about a rock in your win windshield. That sort of pattern. Or you can go out next full moon, take a look at the moon, and you'll actually see these ray patterns. Something else which happens, and this one happens typically on our very, very large ones, is we start to get rings. So you have your, your rim, but also you get these series of concentric uprises around your crater. And this is sort of like, imagine if you dropped a pebble in a very still pond, and then you were able to freeze that pond almost instantly. You'd have these frozen ripples. And that's what it looks like. But this is happening on such a large scale that typically these rings, actually we name mountains. We'll name them montes because they're just so massive. Two more things to mention, and I saved these ones for the last because these are what we're going to be focusing on next time, or part of what we're going to be focusing on. When the impact happens, sometimes it causes fractures. So the force travels through the surrounding material and actually can break it. And if you cut it um, and you were looking at a cross section, it might look like roots spreading out. And again, this is very dependent on what material is being hit and at what speed. Now, if the speed is high enough, if, it's, if we're dealing in what we call hypervelocities, when the impact occurs, it's possible that it can actually make new rock. So the impact, and we, we usually call this either a shock melt or an impact melt, does exactly what it sounds like. It melts that rock, and it's able to, in some cases, actually line the inside of the cavity or the floor of the crater and even spill out around the crater itself. Again, this is something that you can look at the craters on the moon and you see it looks like you dropped something in hot wax. So I want you to keep in mind and remember this idea of shock melt, impact melt, and about these fractures which occur. And we're going to return to that next lecture. That's when we're really going to get into the, the human habitation on Mars. After that, we're going to close up the crater series and we're going to move into life support. And that will be the five weeks of June. We're going to be talking about life support systems specifically for Mars. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen. If you'd like more information, you can find out more about us on livingontheredplanet.com or you can comment in the comment section below. Send us an email directly through livingontheredplanet at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you so much and keep on learning.